Hello friends. You have a concept of a game you'd like to make, but where do you start? It's best to start with a prototype, the smallest possible project in which your game's core mechanic can be played and repeated. Whatever genre of game you choose, try to distill it down to only its most essential components. Don't worry about making anything look or sound good, the prototype only needs to work. This process is often called greyboxing, because the gameplay mechanics can often be prototyped using only primitive shapes, like boxes, spheres, and capsules. You can use placeholder assets if you prefer, but you shouldn't waste any time or effort worrying about how the game looks at this stage in development. The point is to make something that is fun to play. Jamie Griesemer, one of the designers of Halo, called his core gameplay loop 30, 30 seconds, seconds of fun. fun that happened over and over and over and over again. So if you can get 30 seconds of fun, you can pretty much stretch that out to be an entire game. This is what your prototype needs to achieve. Depending on your genre, it may not actually be 30 seconds, but the concept works the same. What will the player be doing over and over again while they play your game? If you've successfully distilled your game's core mechanic down to just its essential components, then the core gameplay loop should also be adaptable to a large variety of different situations. Doing the exact same thing over and over again isn't actually fun, it's only when the player can apply the skills they've learned through repetition to new situations and new environments that they become fun. Encountering a bunch of guys, melee attacking one of them before they were aware, throwing a grenade into a group of other guys, and then cleaning up the stragglers before they could surround you. And so you can have all the great graphics and all the different characters and lots of different weapons with amazing effects, but if you don't nail that 30 seconds, you're not going to have a great game. This 30 seconds of fun gameplay is then repeated over and over again, while keeping it interesting and engaging by changing the level design, enemy placement or AI, and weapons accessible to the player. To prototype a game like Halo, we would only need a first-person camera, the ability to walk, punch, aim, shoot, and throw, plus some enemies to spawn, and some very basic AI to have them attack the player. Both the player and the enemies need to be able to take damage and die, and it would help to be able to display some indication of the player's health. Everything can be represented with primitives or placeholders, as long as it's fun to play. Try to define exactly what the minimum required mechanics are for your prototype. For my survival-like game, the player needs to be able to fight off hordes of enemies with an auto attack, and occasionally level up to get stronger. When you're defining the key features of the game, you can also decide the priority of the features in which they should be built, giving you a concise checklist of things to do and in what order to do them. It wouldn't make sense for me to build out an auto attack function if I don't already have a character or enemies, so I know what features I need to build first. 1. The player can walk around. I like to use a separate script for input handling and character movement, so my character movement script can also be used for enemies. I have the WASD keys and the left analog stick on my controller moving a simple 2D sprite around a blank level in a top-down perspective. 2. Enemies spawn endlessly. I can easily duplicate my player character to create an enemy and change its sprite. Then write an enemy spawner script to periodically spawn new enemies on a timer. I'll probably want enemy spawning behavior to change with each level, so I'll make the enemy spawner a part of my game's level scenes. 3. Enemies move toward the player character. Since characters and enemies are using the same movement script, all I need to do is give every enemy that spawns a reference to the player character, then they can just constantly move toward them. 4. Enemies attack the player. Applying a collider to the enemies, masking the player's collision layer, they can deal some amount of damage each frame as long as they are in direct contact with the player. I'll probably add some enemies to use ranged attacks later, but it's not important for the prototype. 5. The player character takes damage. Giving the character script health and max health variables, these will also be applied to the enemies automatically. But I'll extend the character script with a new class specific to the player character so I can draw it on the UI in a health gauge. 6. The player character dies. I'll create a signal that's emitted when a character dies, and make sure that the game manager reacts to the player character dying specifically to end the run. 7. The player character auto-attacks. 
Every weapon in these games essentially boil down to projectile spawners, even the melee weapons. So I'll need to make both a projectile and a weapon to spawn it. The auto attack can just be triggered by a timer. 8. Enemies take damage. Since the character can take damage, the enemies already have everything they need to take damage too. I just need to make the projectiles collide with the enemies and tell them to take damage. 9. Enemies die. I'll just have the sprite disappear and cue the enemies to be freed when they run out of health. I'll worry about optimizing enemy management when I get to stress testing. 10. Enemies drop items. I'll need to make some items, then add a loot table to my enemies. When they die, I'll have them roll on a loot table to decide what they drop, if anything at all. 11. The player character can pick up items. I could just have them pick up items on collision, but I'll give them a separate collision area that can be adjusted to detect and pick up items. 12. The player character can get stronger. I'll need to declare a table holding the amount of experience points that are required to level up for each level, and emit a signal when the player reaches each level. Then present the player with multiple options as buttons on the UI to raise their stats. Even if the concept of the game you're developing doesn't have any new mechanics, it's important that you prototype the core gameplay loop to make sure you're able to adapt and adjust it, ensuring it feels like the game you want to play, and more importantly, what your audience wants to play. Take the time to get your core gameplay loop feeling just right. If it's a platformer, the jumping needs to feel good to the player. For an action-adventure game, the combat should feel fluid and responsive. This may require including some primitives or placeholders for things like particle emitters, sound effects, or even frame skipping to get it feeling crunchy. No matter what you're making, especially if you're making something experimental or unique, make sure the core mechanic runs smoothly like a well-oiled engine before moving on. Even though your prototype is greyboxed, that doesn't mean you can't start to think about your game's plot or art direction, even more so if you're working as part of a small team so they have something to do too. Just like the game's core mechanic, try to create the bare minimum required to prove the concept for your narrative and art style. Write a synopsis of your game's plot that is concise, limited only to a single paragraph. If you can't, your story is likely too long or complex to be completed within a reasonable time frame. For example, here's a synopsis of what remains of Edith Finch. The story follows a 17-year-old Edith Finch, the last surviving member of her family, as she returns to her ancestral home for the first time in seven years. Re-exploring the house, she uncovers her family's mysterious past and learns about the series of deaths that eventually caused the complete collapse of her family structure. The game is presented as an interconnected anthology. The story utilizes unique media from multiple perspectives and is told through a series of vignettes. However, the player is made to doubt the authenticity of each story being told. The magical realist story touches the themes of free will, fate, memory, and death. For artwork, you should only be producing concept art at this stage in development. It doesn't have to look good either. The purpose is to test to see what you think will work well for your game. This workflow can also be applied to anything else that may be important to your game, like music, sound design, user experience, etc. Limit your development of everything to only the bare minimum required to test it. My synopsis will be... When a cataclysmic time rupture fractures history into overlapping echoes, three champions from doomed eras, Kaito, a forgotten swordsman from an age of myth, the Dirge, once Lena Voss, a college student who outlasted a masked killer's rampage, and Illyria, a fugitive scientist from a post-singularity future, are thrust into a bleeding world where past, present, and future collapse into chaos. As eldritch parasites feed on the unraveling timeline, the trio must battle through anachronistic abominations while deciphering cryptic murals left by a lost civilization that foresaw their struggle. Victory demands forging a new timeline or accepting oblivion to starve the entities beyond time. Here's the concept art I have for my game so far. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. Once you have your prototype, plot synopsis, concept art, and any other supporting materials, you'll have a much better idea of whether or not this game will actually be any good and worth taking the time and effort to fully develop. Like with every step of the game development process, you may want to repeat or iterate on your prototype until you're comfortable moving forward. In the next video, we'll playtest our prototype. 
I'll see you in the next video.